Henry David Thoreau once said, success usually comes to those who are too busy to be looking for it. Fellow talking tacticians, FCC has put their winless streak behind them with two victories on the bounce. Have they been busy fixing their issues? Or are things just looking good due to their opposition? Let's talk about it together. Hey, everybody, welcome into Talking Tactics with Coach Goff. I am Coach Brad Goff, and this is a show where we get busy looking for stuff that makes us sound smart, but we'll let you decide how successful we are at it. FC Cincinnati returned to the friendly confines of TQL Stadium and dominated the visiting Colorado Rapids. The scoreline only finished 2-1, to one, but the orange and blue were the much better side on the night, controlling possession and outshooting the visiting side 25-9. We're going to break down all three goals, what FCC did to allow them to possess the ball so effectively, a few key performers, and we're going to do it all and more with the one and only Justin Hoyt. Justin, how you doing today, my friend? I know you're good. I know you're good. We're not going to talk about it, but I know you're good. Coach, I'm great. What a weekend of soccer. I would call it soccer. What a great weekend. My teams are flying high, Coach. Both teams are winning, but especially Cincinnati. What a team performance. I felt like Colorado was going to be a hurdle to cross, but it all in all, I thought that they had enough um, to beat Colorado, especially at home. What a victory. Great weekend for me. How was your weekend, Coach? How are you doing? Um, you know? Let's just, talk about, let's just talk about the American side of things. Let's not talk well, about... Well, listen, <sighs> even the English side, I can say I'm okay because the match was really? on at 6 a.m. here. So I was like, I'm oh, not waking different. up to see my team lose at 6 a.m. <laughs> so I didn't have to watch that in agony. I just got yeah. to start watching it. I didn't look at the score. I started watching it when I woke up. And as soon as Arsenal went up one nil, I was like, I can't do this. I'm checking the score. I saw it was three to two. I was like, all right, you know, I don't need to watch this match. And I no. just watched the highlights. Bing, bang, bong, as they say. Uh, <laughs> but moving on to Cincinnati, Justin, there is something that's been bugging me. We'll get to the win and all the exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of positivity on today's show. But I wanted to talk to you about Pat Noonan's substitution patterns. You know, other than the forced change of Brett Halsey, he didn't make any other subs until the very end of the game, the 88th minute when he brought on a group of Yamil Assad and Malik Pinto and Kip Keller. And then he brought on Aaron Bupenza in stoppage time. I want to know from you as a player who has been on the substitutes bench, probably for coaches who Quite are often. much willing, <laughs> more willing to put you in yeah. and, and some that maybe hold off. What, what does that do to the the people who aren't getting regular playing time does it dampen morale do they are they still just ready for any moment any minutes they're going to get they're ready for or is it tough to get yourself up for a game knowing the overwhelming chances that you might not get in until after the 80th minute i can speak on both um hands and both aspects of that um one being a player who's we'll talk about the negative side of one player who's been on the bench uh knowing that really you're you're just there you know you're not really going to come on unless there's a really bad injury or unless there's you know something's going to happen that you're going to come on but you know I've been in a situation where I knew I wasn't going to come on and you know I'm an honest player and I've been there and I've I've done it that I've sat there and been like it's it's frustrating let's just put it this it's frustrating knowing that you're a player that probably ain't going to get minutes unless something does drastically happen which more in time doesn't so you know you're not going to get the minute. So it is frustrating. But at the same time, you're a professional. You have that hope that you're going to get on, even if it's five minutes. You want that little bit of five minutes. Even if you do get on that five minutes, you're still frustrated because you don't really, you might not even touch the ball for that five minutes. So it's like, well, why did you bring me on? But at the same time, you want minutes. You want to get on no matter what the situation is. You want to get on. You want to show that you can do whatever you can in five minutes. If it's that five minutes of fame, technically, you, you get that five minutes. You want that five minutes where... I've been in a player where, you know, you know that you're going to come on on a certain minute. Maybe it'd be the 60th minute, the 80th minute. You know that you're going to be that first or second sub. You're raring to go. You want that. You know you're going to come on on the 60th minute. You're raring to go. Even if you should come on on the 87th minute, you know you're going to come in. You're ready to go and you want to come into the game at that stage, whether you're winning or losing, because you know you're going to get that minute that you know, them five, 10 minutes that you're going to get, that you know you're going to get, is going to help later on in the season or if you are to start, you know, later on down the line. So I feel it's a bit of both. I feel frustration will creep in on Bupenza's side because, you know, he's got 
less minutes now in this game. So he will be frustrated. But I saw what we want to see as fans is his impact coming on is that he was determined. You saw him sprint back to to be in a position to help out the defence, which is great. Um, Pinto come in, done a great job. And I just feel, you know, players naturally will get frustrated. Why? Because they want to be in the team. But at the same time, you must understand that the team is doing well. The coach doesn't want to change things too much because he could make subs early on and you could lose the game. And then the fans and everyone saying, well, why did you make that change? Because, you know, you, you gave up a goal or you lost the game because of making subs. So I feel Pat Noonan done the right thing at the right time just to see the game out. Yeah, it for sure shows kind of a lack of uh, trust in those subs in those moments. Like you talked about seeing the game out. Also, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm less worried about a guy like Aaron Bupenza because I think he's a professional and he's going to understand there's a starting spot yeah, there for him to win huh? back. I'm more worried about those guys like Dado Valenzuela, Malik Pinto, those guys who know they're not going to start, but maybe very sporadically, maybe cup competitions, things like that. And so their minutes are going to be those late game minutes. And you know, I worry about them consistently getting fewer than 10 minutes in a game. You know, if you get in in the 75th minute, you feel like you have a chance to go make your case for yeah, more you do, yeah. If you get in mm -hmm. in the 88th minute, it really is just like, don't blow it. Don't don't decrease <laughs> my chance. I'm not going to do anything here to make the coach be like, he deserves more minutes. All I can do is hurt myself here. It's like kind of like a no win situation. I agree with you. They're doing well right now. Hopefully that continues. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, though. So first. We'll let the listeners know that we are sponsored by Apollo Home. Give them a call if you have any HVAC, plumbing, or electrical needs. But before you do that, and while you have your phone out, make sure you head on over to Twitter, Instagram, or Threads and give us a follow. I am at FC Cincy Tag Talk. And as always, you can drop us a note at Cincy Soccer Talk or in the electronic mail slots feedback at CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com. Let's hit the film room. All right, Justin, let's get right to it. Kenta Hagiwara got in touch again and asked that we talk about Pavel Buka. He was he was the one last time who, when I said, I'm what should we talk here. about? He just responded, Buka. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we'll get to Buka, but let's talk about how FCC used the midfielders in general because I think this is where the match was won. Justin, this midfield has been so much better offensively the past few matches. And last week, we talked about proper spacing. We talked about giving Buka more of a role in the offensive third. Uh, but this week, I don't think that was really the case. He didn't push no. forward as much. I think maybe because Colorado's high line and some of the long balls being played. But this week, I think it was about ball progression. And instead of the center backs always playing that ball directly to the wing back and putting them under pressure, I feel like I noticed a difference in how the midfield was used, especially Buka and Obi, and how they were seeing a lot more of the ball in possession in the build-out. Is that something that you noticed? Yeah, I did notice. Um, and I would say that's a great thing. That's a good sign. And it's, like we said last episode and on previous episodes, that we don't want the center backs to keep going wide, keep going wide because they're the cues that teams are wanting. And, you know, you want your central midfielders to be in possession of the ball. And once the central areas, I feel once the ball is controlled in your area in the central areas, I feel you have more options on the ball. When the ball's wide, it's it's kind of predictable. But when it's central, you have loads more options. And I felt that was really effective in this game and worked really, really well. And I feel that that's why we, for the majority of the game, dominated the central areas of this game. Yeah, I think there were some definable patterns of play that I noticed. So like when the ball ended up with the outside center back, the wing back would hug the touchline and pinch back like usual. But instead of playing mm -hmm. that ball to them or instead of the the central midfielder on that side, Buka or Obi showing really hard to that window and trying to get the ball, I noticed those players staying more narrow, even if that meant they were covered by a midfielder from Colorado. And by them staying so narrow, not drifting wide, that left the window in that wide channel for in between the wing back and the center midfielder for that longer line splitting pass into the forwards or into Lucho Acosta checking into that space. And the numbers show that Justin Baird and Kubo combined for receiving 23 progressive passes. I know you're not a numbers guy, but you can think 23 times the ball That's split good. lines into them, right? Uh, they only had five total against Atlanta combined. So 23 to five, even if you take Baird out of that and say, okay, well, what about when Bupenza and Kubo were starting? Bupenza and mm -hmm. Kubo only had three of those passes against Montreal combined and nine against the Red Bulls. 
So this 23 shows that they were really looking and shout out to a listener, John Casey Thomas, who on Twitter asked that we talk about the team playing centrally more often through the forwards. And mm -hmm. I think he was right on. Um, and then, the, then what that did is they would hit those passes, which would loosen up the defense a little bit, and then they could play to the wing back. Or sometimes that wing back would push forward, and Lucho would drop wide to the touchline and get the ball there. Sometimes and often they would just play that ball straight into Bukarobi, and they might even just one touch it straight back out. But we talked about that, Justin, giving those players the trust to play them in tight areas and they would just play it right back out of pressure every once in a while the defense would sag they would turn um that ability to play forward in different ways has made it so much harder to press this back line right it did and you know that's what we want that's what we want to see from the team and i feel going forward if they can play this way more often i feel we'll be a more effective team and not so predictable um going forward yeah, I agree completely. And then to Kenta's point, this allowed Buka to be much more influential in the game. Uh, Buka averages 32 touches in the middle third. He had 56 in this one, showing that he's just getting a lot more of those touches. There's a moment uh, that I think illustrates this really well in the 13th minute, where this is after they'd already been playing those balls into Buka and Obi, and then, then just one touching it back to the center backs. In the 13th minute, uh, I think that it is, at this point, Murphy plays it to Buka in the left half space. And he actually is in a little bit of tight space, but he turns and he pings a great diagonal in behind for Luca Orishano. And he whips a ball in that's kind of like in between Baird and Kubo, so nothing comes of it. But I think those little moments of like being in possession in the middle or the defensive third, then all of a sudden getting into the offensive third. Uh, and that leads us to talking about FC Cincinnati's first goal. Uh, I'll describe it, and then I would love for you to break it down a bit for us and what you see. So there's a throw in on the right with Robinson. It goes all the way back to Alec Khan and they work it out a bit of a, of a bit of pressure. The ball goes, you know, back to a player and then back to Khan and then Khan, instead of booting it long, plays it to Buka in that left half space. Buka is able to turn and carry forward across midfield line. And you see Georgi Mihailovic kind of throw his hands up and ask, like, why wasn't the team pressing on Buka there? <laughs> um but they were covering Orshano and Lucho and even Ian Murphy out wide, which is what allowed that window to be there. Buka carries all the way forward. Lucha is Lucho Acosta is posting up on Keegan Rosenberry, so keeping him on his back. Buka holds the ball until the very last second and then plays Luca Orshano on the left. Rosenberry has to move off Acosta to close down Orshano. Lucho spins off and is available in midfield, so Orshano plays square to Lucho. Lucho receives across his body, shields the recovering defender. Baird shows, plays a little one-two, and I love how Lucha holds off the midfield of Raz, trying to body him, and then first-time shot, nine set, side netting. Justin, what a fantastic team goal. It was a great, fantastic team goal. It's great that um, we've seen that Colorado dropped off. They didn't press high, which they was upset about. Buka was able to, to carry the ball forward, and have in, in doing that, centrally, now he's got a lot of options. Okay, they're playing close attention to um, Lucho. You get the ball wide and what happens. What I like about this goal code is if you if you look back and look at look at the goal closely, if you look at Baird's positioning, he's not being marked by either defender there. He's in between the two of them. And I think that's a key moment in this situation and creating the goal that he's clever enough to stay in between the two defenders so neither one can mark him. One is going to pay close attention to, to Lucho there when he gets the ball. And other than that, He's always checking over his shoulder to make sure that he's in between the two defenders and at the right time. And he, he shows great wall pass. And obviously, Lucho does what he does best. But what is also good about that is that Kubo's in the box and Housey's in the box, which is also great that if anything did happen, the keeper saves it. We've got two people ready for the follow up. But it was a great team goal and great team build up. And, and it's great to see. Yeah, and you can't take anything away from Baird or Lucho there. Such, such good, you know, vision, patience, lovely weight on the little return wall pass. Uh, Lucho's finished fantastic. Uh, one of the things, though, I want to highlight just because we're talking about Buka in the midfield is the patience that he had to commit Laraz in the midfield. Uh, Laraz mm -hmm. is that redheaded player that um, commits towards Buka. And right when he commits, Buka plays Orshano. And then Laraz is trying to recover the whole play. To recover on Lucho. He's the player pressuring Lucho from the back shoulder when Lucho scores. He never fully recovers just because of that little hesitation that Buka had. You know, in all, Buka had five shot creating actions and 10 progressive passes. So I just thought he was really good. Um, Justin, you know, 
Buka has really come into his own the past couple of games, and it looks like he might have finally settled from that, you know, cross <laughs> cross Atlantic move. Yeah, he has, and he, I said it. He he seems like he's fitted in easily, and it seems like he's been there for you know not just the start of the season. It feels like he's been there for two seasons now, and he's really coming into his own. And I feel that the more and more we get him on the ball, and the more we play to his strength, you know, he's going to grow even, even more. And what I like about him is he does a lot of effective things that won't get highlighted watching the games. Um, you watch him closely. I think if you pay a lot of attention to him when he's on the ball, he does the simple things very, very well. And I think that's why it's really effective. But if you watch the game, you won't really pay much attention to it because you know he's doing something he hardly gives the ball away he does the simple things very well but if you really watch him closely coach i feel he has a huge impact on this team especially yeah. going forward um and especially when we get him the ball he makes the simple passes and i feel it's really effective and like that goal he draws a defender to him the midfielder to him and plays a simple pass gives someone else an option and that then creates space for somebody else and that is something that you know, will go unnoticed, but we're highlighting that how good he is at doing that. Yeah, he also played a key part in the in the second goal that we'll talk about later. Um, Justin, the other thing that you'll see, you talk about those simple things Buka does, and we were talking about the midfielder staying more narrow to allow that pass into the forward's feet. You can really see that uh, um, in him because you can see him looking and glancing up the field to try to see Ooh. where like Kubo mm -hmm. and Baird are to try to make sure he stays out of that passing lane. And that understanding of space is so, so key. Uh, Garrett Griffith got in touch to ask about how pushing the wing backs up and finding long diagonals or switches of play earlier in the sequence has helped this attack be more dangerous. And Justin, I think that's more of what we're talking about. These patterns that talk about direct passes into the forwards or talk about getting the ball into Buka and letting him play on the half turn and go, that allows those wing backs to release up the field further more quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't see it as much on the right with Halsey, but Orshana over and over was getting in 1v1 situations <laughs> in spots where instead he usually had two players to beat and a set block defense. In the 13th minute, we already talked about that play. It, part of that was Buka got the ball to Orshano quickly. He could take a touch, look up and cross it. He didn't have a bunch of defenders standing waiting to head that ball away. Justin, as a wing back, when you get that ball and the defense is already set in front of you, and you're asked to create compared to when you get that ball in a little bit of transition when the defense has kind of had their hips turned and are running back towards goal. Talk about the mm -hmm. difference and what that allows you to do. It gives you so much more options. And it's not like, right, I've got the ball here. I've got to beat two defenders. What am I going to do with it? You know, you're second guessing yourself. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I try and take them on? Try and get a little lucky ricochet that sometimes happens uh, with Oriano. But I feel once you've got that time and the ball gets to you early, I feel like your mind's already made up. You're like, right, I've got the ball. I'm 1v1. This is what I'm good at. This is my strength. I can take him on. I've got so much more time and so much more, I would say, options and idea of what I want to do. I've already got in my mind, right, I'm facing him up. I'm going to play a 1-2. Or I'm 1v1. I'm going to take him on. Or I've got space. I can get the ball out of my feet early and cross. I just think it gives you so much more time uh to make the right decision and the right choices rather than getting the ball and having two players on you and then second guessing yourself and trying to create something out of nothing um and it was really really effective and i feel the wing backs in this game obviously once you get the ball a lot earlier and higher up you're a more effective wing back and oriano that's his strengths and i'm sure as the season progresses we'll be able to get yedlin higher up as well I think that would be really, really effective. And we've seen it in, in games when Yedlin's high 1v1, he, he's able to create a cross or create a chance. And Oriana, we've seen it, especially in this game, that um, once he's got it high and wide and early, he's very, very dangerous. Yeah, incredibly dangerous. I'm sure he loves it too, because basically at that point, you're playing more like a winger. And he's like, yeah, you're a winger. Yeah, that's None his that position. Yeah, defense, though. <laughs> yeah uh, forget let's, that. Talk, <laughs> let's talk, Justin, about the midfield defensively, because... I think this is a, a big part where you and I can shed some light here because this game seemed pretty open at times. And Georgie Mihailovic yeah, was getting very. the ball and running at the back line. Um, there's a play in the 48th minute when Corey Baird turns the ball over and there's a quick transition. It's played to Georgie in the hole. And then he's like running at the back line and it ends in a pretty dangerous shot. That's the one, one of Can's two saves where Khan, 
Khan's two saves where Khan dove to his left and kind of pushed it away. And then the defense cleared. Um, the reason why I want to talk about this is because I think it could be shown like, look, the midfield still has these problems. The other team's midfielder, Georgie Mihailovic, is receiving the ball behind them in front of the defense mm -hmm. and creating all these problems. But I thought it looked to me like OB was tracking Cole Bassett, similar to how he tracked Almada against Atlanta, and that they were treating... Um, they were treating Rapids more like they were playing in a 4-4-2 and Georgie was a second forward. So I think yeah. that he was the center back responsibility there. And you see in that play in the 48th minute, it is Murphy who is a little bit late to close down Georgie and Georgie spins Murphy. Murphy tries to foul him and then goes forward. Uh, and I think that that was Murphy's lack of awareness of his rest defense of, oh, I need to be pushed up here because if the ball is turned over, Georgie Mihailovic is wide open. Uh, obviously awesome. those turnovers when Baird, you know, stumbles and turns it over and the opposition is running back towards FC Cincinnati are, are key. But I think also those center backs need to have better rest defense where they push up 100%. onto those midfielders to allow 100%. Obi and Buka to be effective in the offense. Right. hundred percent. Yeah, they do. Um, especially about that minute in the 48th, uh, the minute that you're talking about that, I feel that the team was set. Okay. The only problem is I felt that deep the defense was way too deep. Now they need to discuss and speak who now needs to pick up Mahalovic in that situation. Does one of them go a little bit? You don't have to go man mark him because he's in, I would say, a good position as a striker. But you need to understand that as soon as that ball transitions, you must be aware where he is. Okay, they've done an okay thing by thinking, right, he's got time on the ball, we must drop off. That's natural. But what they need to understand is that they need to get pressure on him early so he doesn't turn. Because, you know, that is giving now the defence and the midfield a lot, a lot more stress and, and defending running backwards. If they're a lot higher up and more aggressive, like the midfield, I think them gaps are a lot smaller. And, you know, they, I feel that they don't get that chance that they just did in that 48th minute. Yeah, and let's be honest, what, you're, what we're talking about here is Murphy needs to be close enough, close enough not to keep Georgie from getting the ball, but to kick him, kick his ankles when he receives it instead. Yeah, at least a little bit of pressure, yeah, not free that you can just turn. Georgie turns, and at that point, Murphy is trying to grab him. And even if he effectively yeah. fouls him there, that's a yellow card for sure. If you just mm -hmm. go through the striker's back there, just give him a little kick on his heels, slow the play down, like it's probably just a foul, no harm done, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The other thing I want to talk about the midfield is this idea of like coverage and shifting and awareness because we know that Obi chases a little bit. And so <laughs> Junior Moreno was so good at shifting to be in the gaps that Obi would leave. leave. Uh -huh. And I think that Buka did a much better job um, yeah. at this. Number one, Buka was tasked. He's always tasked with covering for Orishano on the left, right? Because Buka plays uh -huh. kind of the left side of defensive central midfielder. He did a good job doing this. But also when Obi chases to the right, Buka has to shift over further to the right. So there's not such a huge gap, huge gap. There's a little moment in the 66 minute that shows this. It's right after um, the FC Cincinnati goal. Obi chases over towards the sideline and you see Buka shift over to Obi's side to cover that space. And mm -hmm. Orishano then is pinched to the middle and, and Buka is trusting Orishano there. He spots Mihailovic drifting into that half space. And then as Mihailovic receives the ball, he's able to close him down. He rushes mm -hmm. Mihailovic and Mihailovic tries to turn, uh, tries to pass the ball back and turns the ball over and there's a transition moment. And it's that little recognition. If Buka had stayed on his left side like normal and OB chases, then there's that gap we're talking about. Georgie receives that ball and he's dribbling forward right down at the center backs. But over shifting there is allowing, um, you know, the, the defense to provide better coverage. And, and it's not always perfect. There's a moment right at the 19 minute mark where Obi is chasing Bassett and Buka drops to cover Mihailovic. And I'm like, yes, he's doing it. But then the ball is played to Mihailovic and Obi then <laughs> yeah. chases towards Georgie. And yeah, yeah, when, yeah. when Mihailovic one touches it back out to Bassett, G Buka goes ahead and shifts away thinking, oh, Obi's back. <laughs> and Obi then goes to chase Bassett again. And it's like back to Georgie and they're off and running. Um, but Justin, this kind of shifting and spatial awareness takes time to get used to. Um, do you see this team in terms of the midfield and how they cover starting to settle into that? Do you think it was just like, oh, they did well against Colorado? Or do you think this is something that they can build on and continue to get better? I feel they can build on it and get better. Yes, they are playing Colorado, who are still dangerous um, at times. They showed um, what they was like in the past, but I feel that 
the partnership between Obi and Buka is getting a lot better and that the understanding of the both of them is getting a lot better. And I feel Obi is understanding that Buka can press sometimes and he doesn't have to. Obi is still in the mindset that I'm pressing, pressing, pressing all over the pitch. But I feel once they gain that understanding and the communication between the two of them where Obi can say, right, I'm going to go, or Buka can say, I'm going to go, and Obi says, right, you go and press and I'm covering behind you, or at least one of them stays more central. I feel the understanding is slowly getting there. Yes, it's going to take a few more games, but I still feel that they are getting that understanding between the two of them. And why and we saying that and seeing a better performance defensively from the team is because I feel that they're un- they're getting that understanding together. Um, and that sometimes in this game it wasn't right, and when it wasn't right, you know, the other team looked dangerous. But when their team when Obi and, and uh, Buka got it perfectly right, you know, they was able to 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 stop Colorado. And I feel yeah. that is the way forward. And they're going to learn and grow together. And it's going to be, hopefully, a great partnership defensively. Yeah. And they did a good enough job defensively to limit the Rapids to only nine shots. And really, of those nine shots, only like one or two were from like open play that, that yeah. were dangerous at all. The others came either from set pieces or right in the immediate aftermath of a set piece. So that's what I want to talk about next, because FC Cincinnati was not good defending set pieces, in my opinion, in this match to start right in the second minute. Keegan Rosenberry gets a free header that he heads over the bar. And they were like, it's like four FCC defenders in a cluster with three Rapids players. Rosenberry picks somebody like so he's the player blocking off so one of the big center backs can run and then he just rolls it's like NBA it's a pick and roll and they lob it up for him to <laughs> yeah, dunk definitely. luckily he clanged the dunk off the back of the rim you know it's a mm-hmm. to torture the metaphor um in the 16th minute the first there's a set piece where the first ball is defended well but it pops out to Georgie Mihailovic he pop he floats the ball to the back post that's the one where Kubo was there defending and Kubo like headed it straight back into the middle yeah. And Bassett uh, has a header that hits off the post. And you think there, okay, no big deal. An experienced defender, if it wasn't Kubo, would have headed that out for a throw in. No harm, no foul. But also the team didn't do enough to get pressure on Mihailovic there for that second ball. And then we have to talk about the Rapids goal because it's the 72nd minute. Uh, the Rapids were in a, like a stack formation. So lined up in a straight line. And Orishano was on the center back Bombito. He lets him go as the kick comes in. He doesn't bump him at all. Miazka can't get out in time and Bombito has a free header and heads it in at the near post. Justin, you've been part of set pieces. I know we joke all the time, like, oh, you just mark the post because you don't want to have to worry yeah, about it. You've joke. probably yeah. been that guy at the top of the zone whose job it is to not mark that center back, but to bug the crap out of him when he gets a run, right? And, and Orishano mm-hmm. probably didn't do enough there. Uh, where do you put this breakdown on that set piece in particular? I mean, you can say it's him because... <laughs> You know, that's his man. He's meant to upset him, upset his run. But in this instance, coach, he's just literally just let him, bumped him a little bit and just said, all right, you go, you go ahead. You can go wherever you want. And just watched it for the second balls on the edge of the box, which he's probably told that if the ball goes in the box, you are there for the second balls, anything outside of the box to clear. But at the same time, as that ball's traveling, you can see the player moving you're meant to put your body in front of him to upset his run. You can't let someone like that have a free header who's good in the air. Then you look at it as, I would say, you are trying to mark players that are in a straight line. That's also hard. Miatska's taken the opportunity to be like, right, I've not got someone man-to-man, so I'll be free because I can adjust my body shape to wherever the ball's going and I'll attack that space because I'm good at it. But I just feel that, he was out of timing because obviously, you know, the player's got a free jump on him and he couldn't make it. And, and at the end of the day, it's a free head. Oh, I would say, I call this a free header. Yeah, pretty free. Um, pretty free, but, you know, at the same time, we nitpicking and looking at the goalkeeper to save that. But I feel it's still a difficult save to make. Um, but I still feel on the top of the box, you are that person to upset that player's run. So he yeah, shouldn't have I a just, clear header on that. You need to really bump him hard. You know, you're a lot smaller there, so you're not asked to mark just him. You're just literally him. asked to get in his way and kind of push him off his run, make the timing oh. difficult. Um, there's another set piece in, from a free kick in the 77th minute where they loft it to the back post and the center back Maxo is completely unmarked there. Luckily, yeah. he tries to head it back across the middle and it kind of ricochets off Cole Bassett and is cleared away. Um 
Justin, so I don't think they were good at set pieces. Obviously, their goal no. came off of set pieces. Do you think this is a bigger issue with the way they're defending? Or do you think it was just like an off night? The Rapids showed them different looks. FC Cincinnati wasn't quite prepared, and they'll be, be better going forward as they get a look at this game film. I mean, I hope they're going to get better set pieces. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I hope they're getting better because I don't know if, if I've been looking at it as, you know, as the games are going on, I feel like teams are more dangerous on set pieces and we're not defending set pieces that well at the minute. Is that due to personnel? Um, the height in the team also, is that an issue? Um, where we haven't got, I would say, the, the biggest of teams at the minute, the, the three centre-backs, I would say, that the main headers of the ball. Other than that, if you look at it, coach, who else out of the out of the, the, the defensive three are going to win you headers? Yeah. You know? Without oh, Brandon Vasquez, Ovi. you're exactly right. I mean, it's, a Brandon, it's three centre-backs and a bunch of little guys. Yeah. Obi is not really, you know, he's, he's a decent size, but he's not really someone who's wants to attack the ball or clear the ball with his head. Uh, Buka's not really big enough to to challenge. Bupenza is probably the next best set piece defender in terms of the headers we've seen, and he's been on the bench. And he's been on the bench. So I would say, is that going to be an issue going forward? Uh, hopefully not, because I feel that they will learn from this mistake and, and be able to deal with it. And luckily, it was only one goal they conceded. But, you know, as the season goes on, it is an area that teams might start to target just because of the height difference. Um, yeah. So it's not cause of concern at the moment. And hopefully later on down the road, it's not. Yeah, but we have to look at that because we conceded a goal on a set piece and we conceded a few chances on set pieces. Yeah. The reason why I asked the question, Justin, is because I, I think you hit the head, uh, the nail on the head perfectly. I wanted to see if you, you know, I kind of thought that same thing it, with the height. And uh, I think as a coach, I think, okay, this is a coaching issue because you can't play the exact same zonal defense when you don't have Bupenza in there as you do when you, when you do, because it takes a whole, a big aerial threat or in terms of defensive an aerial defensive threat out of the equation. And so now all of a sudden yeah. you only have three guys in there instead of four that are going to head the ball away. And obviously the other guys can do it, but it's not plug and play. You can't just put Corey Baird mm. or Yu Yakubo in there. We saw Yu Yakubo's defensive header, right? We can't just <laughs> yeah, put yeah, them yeah, in yeah. there and be like, okay, you're a striker. You play this striker spot that Brandon Vasquez played. And now then Bupenza played. And then, you know, now Yu Yakubo converted into Midfielder. I mean, it's not, they're different kinds of players. And so I think the coaching staff needs to adjust that if Bupenza is not going to be on the, in, on the field, um, maybe it yeah. changes. Uh, I don't know. Um, but either way, I, I just think it's got to be looked at in the training room. Yeah. And I feel also coach, uh, sorry to add to this. It's like, what's going to start probably happening is that teams will now block Murphy, Meowsk and Robinson or Keller or Hagland, whoever it is make sure that they're marking one of their biggest men and then someone else will be free who they can't pick up or you know who'll have a free header on someone a little bit smaller than them they will make sure that their main free headers of the ball are distracted and can't get a free head on it like you say a pick and roll and then someone else will be able to come in freely um so okay they dealt with it okay-ish but you know further down the line i think this is what teams will start to target Cincinnati with um, as we move on in the season. I think you're right, Justin. Uh, let's take a break and then we're going to come back and talk about some individual performances that we want to highlight. Beyond Exercise is a local physical therapy and fitness company that helps anyone get and stay active. In fact, they have helped Nick Hagman and Brandon Vasquez with their physical therapy and strength training needs during the offseason. And currently, they're still offering their $50 discount for ACL injury prevention screen, which was piloted by Nick and Brandon. Learn more at GoBeyondExercise.com. I also want to let you know that this episode is unofficially brought to you by Seismic Brewing Company's Hazy IPA. This beer is delightfully juicy with a lot of citrus and enough pith to balance. You get none of the peppery notes that you sometimes get with hazy IPAs that have a lot of citrus. I gave this one a 4.5 out of 5. If you want to talk to me about beer or soccer, you can get in touch with me on the socials at FC Cincy Tac Talk. If you have a question or comment, you can get at me there or send me a note to feedback at CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com. 
All right, Justin, Rich Makaras got in touch and says, how about the other things that Baird has been doing? All the dirty work, chasing down balls, leading the press. Let's talk about some of those so people can get off his back. Well, Justin, <laughs> Corey Baird got people off his back by scoring a goal, so that's a good thing. But I do want to start Happy. by talking about some of those other things. Obviously, Pat Noonan loves what he brings along with Yu mm -hmm. to the press. Because not only can he initiate the press as that point, but he also does a really good job of dropping into the midfield as a covering player. This mm -hmm. press just looks better with Baird, Kubo, and Lucho than it has all season with Bupenza or anybody else, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. It, it, it has. Uh, it's 100% coach. Um, and I feel they've got a good chemistry going on, the three of them. Um, I feel Baird understands his role as, as a defensive striker. Um, in the defensive third. I feel the timing's right when Lucho's further forward, Baird and Kubo understand that they need to drop or one of them drops. And I feel between the three of them, they've got a great understanding. Where I like Baird is because he's he knows what he can bring. He's, his timing of closing down is very good. He understands when to press, when not to press. And he does a lot of dirty work that we might not notice, but he does work his socks off coach. And I've got to give it to him. He does work hard. Okay, he's not scored as many goals as we like, but the fans might be on his case. But coach, I fairly feel that when he's been in the team, I feel that he's really, really helped defensively, um, which totally. is, we want to talk about a striker attacking wise. But defensively, I feel like he's really, really helped this yeah. um, start in the press from higher up. And he tracks back like this is what you're talking about. The defense really does track, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He tracks mm -hmm. back sometimes relentlessly. There's a moment in the 80th minute where his team is up a goal and there's a foul and the Rapids kind of take it quickly. And Mihailovic has the ball in transition. Baird sprints to pressure him from behind. Sprints. Mihailovic plays the ball out to the wing and Baird continues sprint all the way out to pressure the winger. And in the this time, he runs right by Orishado, who is the yeah, left yeah, wing yeah, back yeah, to pressure, that, thinking, pressure yeah. that wing back. So it's like just that work rate being to go cover the guy you're running past to cover his spot. In the 86th minute, Lucho turns the ball over in the attacking third and Baird tracks back into the 10 spot, which is pretty normal. Your 10 turns it over, you drop into that 10 spot. But then Mihailovic makes a run to the corner and Baird tracks him all the way out there, that run. That's something that Lucho doesn't do as a 10. So to have yeah. a forward who drops in as a makeshift 10 that then also tracks that runner is pretty incredible. But let's be honest, Justin, strikers got a score. Um, and Baird had hit some chances. There was a moment in the 36th minute when Lucho turns the corner and plays in Kubo, and it's a little bit of a slightly overhit pass. Stefan comes out and knocks it away, and Baird is tracking away from the goal, managed to manages to get a pretty good shot away through traffic, but it hits the crossbar and goes over. And that chance, I was like, man, you got to make that, Corey, at first. Um, when I looked back, I thought maybe it was a, a tougher chance than I thought. What Just really quickly on that chance, is that a big miss, another big miss from Corey Baird, or did he make a really tough chance look closer with good technique? I thought he made a, the second coach. I think he made a, um, a really good chance with... Uh... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll say the second coach. I'll say the second. <laughs> yeah, I see you wanted to say. You got to uh, score think... there, Corey. You got to score there. He yeah, just, the you, way you, I looked you, at it, yeah, yeah. he was a little far forward of the ball. So he yeah. was kind of moving yeah. away from the yeah. goal and trying to still keep his hips on frame and shoot it. That's all I mean. It was a little bit tougher. The, yeah, the I mean, XG, yeah, which tough. I know you love tough. stats, the XG was only 0.18, which means, you know, basically only two out of five of those shots go in. So, you know. He wasn't, yes, he it's not necessarily one. one where he was expected to score, let's say. No, he but let's talk about what we've been waiting for. His breakthrough in the 64th minute, what because finish. he finished this goal like he had just been banging goals in all season. Um, <laughs> SEC has good possession. They cycle it to the left to Ian Murphy. Murphy plays Buka in a bit of tight space, like we were talking about. Instead of Buka playing it straight back out like he had been a lot, he's able to get on the half turn, touches it wide. Lucho had dropped into the sideline and pushed Orshano up like we've been talking about. So that allows Orshano to cut inside, makes a little darting run. Buka finds him with the outside of his foot. Uh, Orshano takes a really good positive touch forward, then plays Baird with a pretty straight ball. And then, like we said, Baird, man, goalkeeper's coming out. He just takes a look, smiles, blows on his nails a little bit, gives the get off me <laughs> shoulder, and then just flicks it right over the goalkeeper. Nice little touch, Justin. Did, were you on your feet like I was? I was buzzing for him. I was so happy for him because, uh, you know, even the commentators were saying, 
you know, he's trying, his chances are going to come, he's going to get his opportunity, he's going to score, he's going to score. And it was, it was coming, it's coming every game, it's getting closer and closer and closer. So for him to finally get that goal, it is a sigh of relief for everybody and everyone I feel was just happy for him, even the players. And I, what I like about him, coach, is not only the finish was calm and collective, like he'd been scoring all day long. And some of his highlight reels when he was playing at Houston, he scored a similar goal to that. I like that. And we'd seen it on his highlight reel. So that's kind of what he brings and he's got in his locker. So he's shown it again that he's got that type of finish in him. OK, sometimes he misses the, the, the chance that we think he should score, but he's got this 1v1, calm and collective, chips over the goalkeeper, nice. But what I like about him is his positioning, coach. His positioning for this goal is great. Like I say, he was in between the two defenders again, and he makes that run that he that makes very often in games, that run in behind. And when you've got space and players that can play you in behind and he makes that run, I like the fact that he looked across the line just before um, he received the pass as well to make sure he stayed online. That is another thing that we probably wouldn't see and take note, that he actually paused a sec to see if he was onside, carried on running, and then, as you say, coach, took a little bit of time on his left foot, dinks the keeper. Thank you very much, 2-0. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it was <laughs> just a really good goal. Like you said, the way he kept him on, himself on side, the weight from the pass from Orishano, oh, nice. it's a little bit over hit. You, you don't have that time. If it's under hit, nope. and you're trying to do the same thing we talked about with his missed chance where you're kind of shooting it from your behind your body. Um, all that said, Corey Baird was not flawless. He still has this thing, and I'm hoping that this goal will help him shake it off, where he hesitates, right? Like in the 14th mm -hmm. minute, mm -hmm. Yedlin and Lucho combined to play Baird into the right top corner of the box. He turns the defender, and right then, he can go at the defender and try to beat him. He can pass square to Kubo. He can try to cut the ball back to the top of the box for Lucho or Obi, but he kind of stutters, and then he shoots it, and the defender just like, okay, just blocks it, and it goes out. <laughs> In the 48th minute, there's a long ball from Lucho. Kubo chests it down to Baird. Baird dribbles forward, and you can see he's not quite sure what to do. He kind of stutter steps. Um, he waits too long. Then he tries to play the ball back to Kubo, and the pass is blocked. When he had a wide open player, Halsey to his right, or he could have shot. So I think that's a confidence thing. I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that that's a confidence thing and, and because I don't see that in the rest of his tape. Now, granted, I had not been a big studier of Corey Baird, but I scouted him when he made it that when he came to FCC and he doesn't seem like the hesitation type. He knows what he wants to do. I think it's still just trying to get on the same page with the rest of his team. Uh, hopefully the goal will do a little bit to lighten the load there, Justin. Yeah, I think it will. I think he second guesses himself a lot sometimes. Um, and like we say, he's still settling into this side. Um, we're still yet to see. We see it in, in parts and bits and pieces in games. But I feel a good run in a game, run a game, starting, understanding his role, knowing his role, the team playing to his strengths. I feel that he will gain that confidence and be a much better player. And moving forward, we're going to see a lot more from him. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's talk about his running mate because Bill Baleo one got in touch and wants us to talk about Kubo up top because, uh, you know, he says, full disclosure, Kubo has been my favorite player for a couple years now. Same <laughs> Bill Baleo. I love as a coach. I just love Kubo. He's just willing to do anything. Uh, anything Bill Baleo wants to know if it might be like a really good distraction, almost more than skill. Just the fact that he helps the offense by being a distraction to the defense, you know, he is so good at so many different things, Justin. He's so good at dropping off the back line. There's moments, fifth minute, he combines with Lucho and Orishano and then hits a pretty good shot from 28 yards to test Stefan early. In the 10th minute, he drops in around the midfield line in the right half space, gets on the ball, pivot, pings a 40-yard diagonal to DeAndre Yedlin getting forward. But that's not all he does. Whereas you see Bupenza drops in pretty effectively, Kubo also runs in behind relentlessly in the 24th minute. Running off the shoulder of the center back, Orishano drops a dime over the defense, and Kubo tries to kind of scoop it with his first touch towards the net. Doesn't quite get enough contact, and Stefan saves. Uh, 46th minute, 78th minute, other moments when he's running in behind. Justin, as a defender, when you have no idea whether that forward is going to drop into midfield and really effectively Horrible. combine or run in behind you, how does that mess with your head? It's, it's horrible. You don't know whether they're going to drop to get the ball. You don't know whether to mark them. Then sometimes you think, right, I'll go tight because he's dropping to get the ball. Then the next minute he's running in behind you. As a defender, it's horrible. Why? Because now you're second guessing yourself. 
you're thinking if I go tight, he's going to run in behind. Okay, I don't want to get tight because I know he's going to run in behind. So I drop off a little bit, expecting the, him to run in behind. Then he gets the ball short. As a defender, you're you're then thinking, well, what do I do? Well, how do I now stop him and affect him from doing what he's doing? And his game understanding and under, and knowing what to do must drive these opposite defenders crazy. And knowing me as a defender and knowing I don't like playing against them kind of players, it would drive me mad. And it would annoy me until I had to kick him to make sure I, he knew I was around him. <laughs> And that is distracting to the defense, like Bill Baleo said, because the defenders have to track that. He also has little moments of really intelligent movement movement in the 67 really? at the 67 minute mark or Shano has the ball on the left and dribbles inside. And as he goes to pass to Kubo, I, I don't know if Baird gives him a shout or Kubo just kind of feels it. He passes it towards Kubo, but Kubo darts in behind out of the way of the ball, almost like a dummy. Baird scoops it through to Kubo and Kubo gets on the ball. That's the play where he avoids Stefan coming out puts it in the back of the net. He's caught offside at first. He was onside. But when they looked at the replay to see that he was onside, they noticed the ball grazed his hand. And the rules state something about, you know, that might not be a call to handball anywhere else because it wasn't intentional. But if you handball it any at any way, right before you score a goal, the goal, the goal doesn't count. Um, but mm. that movement was really good. And he did it a few other times in the match. Ja that's just the most notable. So again, Justin, just forwards like Kubo being able to do all of the things and make all of the runs we've been demanding. Bupenza is a way better player, way better in a lot of ways. Yeah, but Man, I'm Kubo sure. has the movement over top of him. And I don't know if that's something Bupenza can develop and, and learn or if it's something that he's never going to do. No, I feel Bupenz has got it in him. Um, I just feel at the minute, the way the team set up, that Kubo and, and Baird are the perfect ones for that. And I just feel at the minute, in this formation, the way the team wants to play and is playing, I feel you have to have Kubo in there. Bupenza can do it, but I feel Kubo is more effective in his, in his movement, in his game understanding and the way he plays. Now, if we're talking about finishing, who is going to be the better finisher in this team? Bupenza is going to be the much better finisher. But at the minute, we're getting away. And, you know, Kubo's come up and scored. Baird's come up and scored. Lucho's come and scored. Because they're having that combination play and that match understanding, that they're understanding how to play as a free. And they're causing trouble. And they're getting okay. chances. But now when we need a natural number nine to score goals, we need, Bu we, let's be honest, we need Bupenza because he is the goal scorer. He knows how to score in different ways. Yeah, and we have a question later about starting in Bupenza that we'll get to. Um, MLA since he got in touch via threads. That's right. We have a threads account as Threat. well. Nice. Since he talked to us. Good. We followed Justin on there. Uh, MLA since he said, I thought Brett Housey played well. What did you think? You know, Justin, uh, this team relies so heavily on wingbacks for receiving progressive passes, um, for creating chances. Uh, even if not directly, they're often part of that sequence. And uh, it hasn't been super effective until last week with Yedlin. We saw Orishana mm -hmm. step up in a big way this week. Howsey came in. And you could notice the drop off between him and Yedlin, right? Not only yeah, did he have yeah. a nervy start, mm -hmm. first touch was a turnover. He almost let a ball go under his foot out of bounds. And then 25th minute, there's that Lucho floats that ball to the back post and he can't get a good touch to direct it back across the goal. Um, we talked about off the jump of the show being a sub and thinking, I'm probably not going to get on at all, or maybe at the very end of the game. It was probably what is it like mentally to all of a sudden in the 17th minute be like, oh, there's an injury, you're up. <laughs> it, it's it's hard to get I would say it's harder to come on at that stage because you've got to get up to the speed of the game and getting up to the speed of game after say the 17th, 15th, 20th minute is very hard because you're still not 100% ready because you're still I would say in warm-ups more relaxed you know you might not come on Yedlin plays the majority of the minutes no he's probably not going to come off to now then get called automatically straight away right you've got to be on you have to get up to game speed straight away. And it does take a little while for you to get up to match speed. And if you haven't played a while, it takes even longer. I'll be honest, coach, I was surprised how's he come in and not Powell. Yeah. Because Powell was normally going to be the replacement for for Yedlin. But I thought how's he come in, looked a bit nervy at the start, which is bound to happen. But 
you know, you've seen a drop off, the different in, I would say, the difference in quality that you get from Yedlin and the game understanding from Yedlin than you get from Halsey. But I felt he'd done an okay job. Yeah. You were surprised. I was surprised. You know who, who else was surprised? Brett Halsey. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, he probably was surprised. He was probably sitting there thinking, oh gosh, it's me up now. Let's go. And but yeah, like, he would have said, he would have been excited. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And he definitely settled down. There's a moment in the 29th minute after a pretty good Lucha pass that plays him in where he has a pretty good cut back to Yuya Kubo and Kubo's shot is blocked. Could have been an assist. He has a decent shot in the 47th minute from a tight angle. It's a pretty easy save, but he hit the ball hard enough that Steven deflected it up in the air and it's cleared out after that, but that could have been a dangerous moment. He was effective both offensively and defensively. I still don't think this is him being like, I deserve to start. I don't think that he's at that level. Uh, I saw that drop off between Yedlin and him, but mm -hmm. I can see yep. him making a play saying, you know, Alvis Powell, why don't you go be the the third choice center back? Because I, this right side of backup is mine. Hmm. Yeah, which is, like I said, it's surprising that they didn't bring Powell on, on, on uh, the right side because normally you would think that's the natural replacement. How's he brought on the left? Whereas now I feel that, Assad is going to be that, I would say, replacement for Oriano. And as it seems now, House is going to replace Yedlin. And I see that they're probably thinking that Powell now will be that defensive outside back, uh, central back. But then I also feel that he's bringing that experience into the team, um, Powell. And I also still feel that he will be effective as the season goes on. Yeah. Now we're talking about frustrating frustration and not getting minutes. How does that affect players? Now yeah, we'll we're thinking see. something different, you know. But especially, yeah, I think Powell is more professional enough to understand his role in the team at the minute. Yeah, and especially coming into closeout games, like when you're already ahead. I think Halsey yeah. got the call because it was early in the game and they still need a lot so, of yeah. offensive thrust. Mm -hmm. I think Powell doesn't really do that anymore. He can. We've seen him, especially dribbling, have the ability, but he's really more of a defender at this point. Um, yeah. Justin, all man Terry also got in touch with threat on threads to ask, uh, he says, was it me or was Murphy really good last night? Um, Murphy was really good last night. I'm I thought in fact, I was surprised he came off I the like field, him. but then somebody in our Slack channel was like, oh, but he was cramping up. And when I watched the replay, I saw him cramping. Yeah, up. he was cramping. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Offensively, we talked about those modes of ball progression and how much that spacing means the outside center backs have responsibility for picking those passes correctly. Murphy was third on the team with eight progressive passes, and he had more than Robinson or Miazga. And he played some really nice balls into space for Orishano as well. And then defensively, he ends up being the de facto left back at times. And of course, it's covering for Luca when Luca goes forward. But even tactically, when we talked about um, Buka, overshifting toward the right when Obi is chasing. Luca Orishano is pinching towards the middle in those situations, and I think that's a tactical setup from the coaching staff. I don't think he's wandering, which means when that ball switches quickly, Murphy is the left back, and he is in 1v1 situations. And the Colorado Rapids attack down his side 42% of the time, um, but he did a phenomenal job positioning himself to eliminate passes that would have put him in bad spots. He had three interceptions on the night. Uh, Justin, talk a little bit about what you've seen in Ian Murphy in this match and his growth as a player. No, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his coach. You know how a big fan of him is his, and I feel he's growing. Um, I feel he's bringing out his own personnel in the team, his own personality into the team. And I feel his positional play in games, and especially in this one, is improving and was a lot better in this game. I feel like he's understanding where he needs to be when Oriano is attacking. I feel sometimes he does get caught out in, no, I call it no man's land, but I feel majority of the time he's got the speed and the strength to be able to recover and make good defensive decisions. But his positional play and his growth as a defender, when he plays, when he's not playing, I'm surprised. When he's playing, I feel he grows and grows and gets better and better. And like I say, I feel like he's another Miles Robinson. He's got the potential to be similar to how he is. He's still young. He's still learning his trade. And I feel that, you know, moving forward, he, he has to start majority of the games. I feel even offensively, coach, I feel he's getting better on the ball, making yep. better passing decisions. And even when he has to push into the space and drive with the ball, when there's open space, he's making the right decisions and doing that. 
and that's a growth in a player who's coming into his own out of his own shell and really showing that right i'm in this position this position's mine this is what i can bring to the team offensively look at my passing defensively i'm learning better positional play by playing more games i'm gaining more confidence in doing so and i'm communicating more and all in all he's becoming a better player from doing all that and i'm i'm a, yeah. I'm a huge fan of his coach i'm really happy. same I've been saying for quite some time that he, like from last year, I was saying he was the best yeah, like ball-playing center yeah. back on the team in terms like of him. passing. Um, that weakness that you talked about, about getting caught in no man's land. I think every center back is going to get caught there sometimes. I think the big Especially difference the is Murphy right. then overcommits after he gets yeah. caught. So mm -hmm. we talked about that moment in the 47th minute about his rest defense. The issue is not necessarily that he wasn't tight enough on Georgie. That's the ideal for him to be tight enough to, tur to not get turned there. But it's that he goes and tries to get tight and then gets rolled, not just turning yeah. the defenders and the offenders running at you, but he gets rolled where he gets put on that defense on that attacker's hip. It happened in the 49th minute that but at the edge of the box this time. And that's where Georgie rolls him into the box and he ends up tugging on Mihailovic's shirt. And, mm -hmm. and then Mihailovic tries to shoot or whatever. And then after it doesn't work out for him, he goes down and wants the PK. Um you know, but that kind of weakness, I think that's like uh, an instinct. It's not a technique. And I think that just takes years to develop of how fast am I? How quick is that player going to turn? And can I close him down before he turns? Or do I need to go ahead and let him turn and then defend him 1v1? It's that time in the show when I take a minute to thank all of you for downloading today's episode or watching or listening online, whatever you're doing. Thanks for doing it. And thanks in advance for spreading the word. You can always help us by rating and reviewing the show over at CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash Coach Apple Podcast. We're stuck on 80 reviews. I'd love to push that through the top to 100 by the end of the season. So if you haven't done that in a while, go do it again. If you haven't done it at all, get to it. You can also become a supporter of Cincinnati Soccer Talk over at CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com slash support. And then you know the deal. You set the agenda for this show. Do you have questions for us about tactics and coaching? Do you have topics? Do you want to get Justin's player's perspective, Justin's perspective on something as a player? You can always get at us on Twitter or Instagram or drop us a note in the mailbag. Speaking of the mailbag. All right, Justin, Jared, Red Squad, All Man Terry, Lane Vallejo, all want to know about how concerned we are with Bupenza being on the bench. What's his role going to be going forward? And maybe talk a little bit about Kevin Kelsey and how he might be integrated. First, Justin, uh, how concerned are you with Bupenza being on the bench? And, and do you think that's going to be his role, at least in the near term? In the near term, I feel like it's going to be his... <laughs> I would say role, but I would say it's not a bad thing because he's a great impact player to come on. If you're down and you need a striker to come on to cause, um, to bring something different to the forward line who the forward line aren't doing it at the minute, I think he's a great substitution to have. A amazing substitution. He scored goals. He knows how to score goals. He brings something different to what the strikers have at the minute. He's a striker. He's a goal scorer. Am I concerned with him being on the bench? No, because... That means the players on the field, Kubo, Lucho and Baird, are doing the job that the team needs to, to win games. The only concerning thing is why people might be concerned is that, is it going to change his mentality? I don't think so, because when he come on, he, he done what he needed to do to help the team. Defending, he had to defend. He done that. I felt attacking when he had to hold the ball up. He done that. Now, yeah. as, we, as the season goes on, we're going to need him, coach. So I, I, totally. I don't feel there's a concern at the minute. I don't feel. I just feel that it's credit to the players that are playing at the minute that they're doing a good job to keep him out of the team. Yeah, I think sometimes as fans, we think MLS centrically and we think he's a DP. He shouldn't be. He, yeah, I mean, he be should be furious yeah, to be yeah, on the bench. Mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, you but, be. but he is a professional and he has been on the bench before. He has not been the kind of player anywhere where he's been, where he was like the guy, the star playing yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time. He's come yeah. off the bench before, so he should be able to be professional about it. Now that doesn't mean he's happy. He's still going to be pushing for that starting job, but he should be able to be professional. I think the bigger issue right now is that MLS uh, metric and that's roster construction. And that's mm -hmm. like, as a B DP, if you're not getting production out of your DP, do you have enough talent underneath? that to get the job done um we talked about what baird and kubo are giving you uh so let's turn now to kevin kelsey who is a teenager venezuelan and he is raw 
Um, I think he is going to help a ton as a target player with late game long balls, another way forward when maybe the team is struggling to progress, a target in the box when the opposition is sitting deep. But I would not expect him to grab a starting role right away and no. maybe not even at all, probably not even at all this year. Justin, you've spoken about it a little bit, but talk about how difficult it is, uh, maybe even as a teenager or, or as a young player, to change countries into a new team that's already gelling and integrated and kind of get yourself going and be part of the group it's, 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 it's a young player it's probably it's probably the hardest in the older experience but it's a lot easier um i would say someone who's um coming from abroad let's call it abroad coming into the mls you have to understand that structure the, the gameplay you have to fit into the way the team is playing while at the same time you're trying to show the team what your strengths are uh, and trying to get that into fruition with how the team is playing now how many minutes is he gonna get you know you've got bupenza on there Who, who's gonna who's gonna be the first substitute if the team's winning okay he might bring him on to get a couple minutes but if the team's losing you'll probably bring him on a lot earlier but if the team keeps winning then we're not gonna see him come on from the start so he might only get 10 minutes here there you know but like i say, the way Coach, pat sums, two thing. minutes two yeah like two, two, two minutes you're gonna get and as a striker, what can you really do in two minutes, coach? Let's be honest. In two minutes, if you're defending to see out the game, you might get the, the odd one long ball that you have to chase. But during the chase time, they're the midfield to like Bupenza. Yeah, and you have to keep the ball in the corner, coach. At the end of the day, if you are forward and you get the ball long, you have to run into the corner to see the game out. You're not going to run for goal. We, we, we don't want you to run for goal. We want you to get the ball into the corner and, and hold it up. It's going to be hard for him, coach. Let's be honest. It's going to be hard for him to come in and make a huge impact straight away. How would he make an impact or will we see more of an impact if the team is losing? We need him to come on and, and be the difference maker. Then I feel we'll see something. Now we're talking about League Cups coming up. Is he going to play in that? Probably get some minutes in that. Yep. Then we will see what his qualities are in them League Cup games. I feel he will get his opportunity. Then we need to see what he's really good at. Yeah, the the one thing I will say is, you know, I've scouted Kelsey pretty extensively. Okay, yeah, more than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll put a, a an article out on CincinnatiSoccerTalk.com yeah. with Nate Gilman and mm -hmm. I, um, breaking him down. Uh, this team it will will be at its best. It has its highest ceiling if Bupenza and Kelsey are the two starters up top by the end of the season. Will that happen? I. I doubt it i think but when you talk about just talent and what these players can do and a lot of the talk nationally from matt doyle and other pundits like that is that the presence of kelsey should help bupenza a lot because the one thing you don't have to else ask kelsey to do or instruct him to do justin is to stay high at those center backs and battle them he loves contact with the center backs he's oh, gonna bang he? around up there and then bupenza can kind of float around That's and get on want. the ball and kelsey is going to take a lot of that pressure so i'm hopeful that that'll help um but but the best situation is going to be if Baird and Kubo are playing so well that Pat Noonan is like, I don't know if I can get these other guys minutes because that means that they're all pushing each other. And that's the hope. Uh, is that K1, the number partnership we're looking at? Sorry, coach. Is that the no. other partnership? So in twos now, we're looking at a partnership. Is Kelsey and Bupenza the partnership that, you know, the team are looking at? Is that what they're looking for? Or is it Baird and Kubo? Now there's a question. Who is going to do the job right as a partnership? Who's going to make it work? Who's going to make it tick? Or are we going to not see Bupenza and Kelsey? Are we going to see it completely switch and Kelsey play or Bupenza play? We don't know. But as you say, coach, at the minute, it's Baird and Kubo have got the starting spot. Now, will it change to Bupenza and Kelsey further on down the line to see us as winners? We don't know, but it's going to be interesting, okay. coach. It's going to be it's very gonna be fun. And Sorry they still might me. bring in somebody else bigger or or somebody else in know. the uh, summer. So uh, that's the best part about this getting done in this primary transfer window, this early one. Kay Wanch got in touch on threads and says the team is gelling much better the last few weeks and wants to know if it's from a specific tactical change or just a natural byproduct of improved team chemistry. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's Bupenza dropping to the bench. I do think that Pat Noonan has put in some more specific patterns of play. I don't know if he didn't do this before, or maybe the team just got it now, but I did not notice before those avenues being in 
intentionally created to play the ball into the strikers. Now they are. So either he has changed and simplified things. And instead of just saying, okay, we're going to build from the back, go play. He has said, we're going to build from the back and here's how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And anytime you either put that in place or get that message across when the team wasn't getting it, even if you were trying before, that simplifies roles and team chemistry yeah. gets better because you know, oh, I'm supposed to be out of the way for this forward to check <laughs> yeah. into this space. And so there's not confusion there. I know what I'm supposed to do. So I think it's a little bit of both. It's clearly, you have to learn your team, but I think also those tactical ideas help you play a little bit better. Have you ever been part of a team where midway through the season, you either have a new uh, tactical wrinkle put in place or something is clarified and all of a sudden you're like, oh, now we can do this. <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden you're winning more games, you're playing a lot better. And the confidence in the team code, you would, you would think it is a completely different team. And all that's happened is you've made the game, I would say you've made the game a lot simpler. The tactics are a lot easier the gameplay and understanding you understand it just because the coach might have said right i want you to make this pass or these are one or two other options or you know defensively i want you to stay here and you to stay there all of a sudden it's gelled after two three games and you're like well hold on a minute we are actually a good team what happened to us before why didn't we know this and all the coach has done is change two things and all of a sudden you're like a brand new team that everyone's like oh my gosh what a team they are and that probably happened with us and the USL coach, I'll be honest. When we won on our winning streak, coach, I feel that at the start we wasn't too good, but we made one or two tweaks and all of a sudden we was flying. And I feel that this is what's going to happen with this team and it can only get better, I feel. Speaking of, I, I've been watching that nonstop flight documentary. I don't know if you've pulled it up Apple TV and watched it, but you oh, yeah, it prominently. Yeah. So it is common in my household. Every time you're on the <laughs> team, I'm like, Justin, and, and my family looks at me like, what are you talking about? I'm like, that was Justin. <laughs> Boy, come on, guys. Anyway, I'm happy so, to be even be on there, coach. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a celebrity, at least in my heart, if not in my entire household. Oh, so. um, really quick, my buddies, Jeff and Lance, we were texting about this, and I promised I'd ask mm -hmm. you, they want your thoughts on Miazga's yellow for descent is he a marked man now is this refs because it was so quick is this just refs being like when miazga yells at me for any reason i'm guarding him or you know is this on him like he needs to quit arguing like is this more like the refs being unprofessional and marking him or do you think matt needs to tone it down a bit or or a combo what do you think i don't think matt can and i feel that if we are telling it no i'll be honest coach if we tell matt to stop I feel that will stop how he plays and how he is as a, as a defender. I feel that he needs to talk to the referee every now and again. Any situation, even when he's carded, he's going to the referee. Every situation, he's there. And I feel that there's players that I've played with are that type of player. There's players that you played with have to annoy the opposition. You know, Zlatan was like that when you played against him. He has to annoy and, and do something to your, the opponent. And they do that just because that's their, their way of being, right, I'm feeling confident about myself. This is how I play. This is who I am. And I feel if you take that away from Yasgar, he's a completely different player. I feel he needs to be that annoyance yeah. in the team against it's opponents. If you take that away from him, that's his swag. That's who he is. But I feel referees are now like, right, if you're going to start talking to me like that, it's a yellow card. That's going to stop you. And that's the only way that he will stop is if he gets carded yeah. early. I, I hope that the refs, though, have a little bit more thick skin in this one. He, it looks do. like he comes to the ref. It doesn't look like he's yelling or anything. It no. looks like he says like something like, oh, come on. The ball was here and he put his mm. head down and the ref was like pocket right away. Yellow card. Yeah. Didn't most refs you'll see like point away, like go away and then card. But this was so quick. I think this was an agenda from the ref. But I, I do agree with you that Matt has that. Uh, he's got to play yeah. with that tip on his shoulder. Let's close it out with this. Todd Merritt asked a question via email last week. So a true mailbag. So I had to get it in here. We didn't get to Let's it last go. week. Essentially, Todd thinks FCC is missing Alvaro Barrial more than we are talking about. And he wants to know if there's any chance of him being recalled to FCC. So first of all, uh, Todd, get in touch. I'd love to know if you think Luca's recent performance has done anything to make you feel better about FC Cincinnati because Luca has been really good the past two matches. Mm -hmm. really um, good. I don't think there's a chance of Barrial being recalled because I don't know the specifics no. of the loan agreement, but with the, it's a loan with an option to purchase. And I think the recall mechanism is written in as if FC Cincinnati get another offer, they can recall him to sell him to the other team. Yeah, that's what's um, going to happen, yeah. 
Basically. But we talked about patterns of play and we talked about uh, how it looks like this team has figured some things out ball progression. The thing I wanted to know from you, Justin, is do you think that those patterns of play, and I know we're speculating, do you think maybe they weren't in place because last year they could just play it to Barrial and Barrial would work out of pressure over and over and over? And this year they thought, oh, Luke will do the same thing and he just didn't right away. Do you think that or or do you think like, no, it's probably been something they've been doing this whole time and we just didn't notice it. We didn't need it as much last year because of Barrial. I feel we don't need, we didn't need it as much as we did last year with Barrial because you know, he used to create a lot of chances. He, he was one of the highest assists. You get the ball wide, he's going to create an assist. He's going to score. So you didn't really miss that. You don't. You, you know, you missed that. But I felt at the start, it did take Barry out a little while to adjust to that formation and understanding of, you know, where am I going to play? Am I going to get on the ball? What am I going to do? If I still feel it took him a little while, he didn't automatically get that partnership with Lucho. That come over time. Oriano is getting that. And I feel game by game, he's improving. Attacking-wise, you see what a threat he is, coach. In each game, I feel he's getting better. I feel was there, they're saying we're missing it because we had so much delivery from that side. We I felt like we played in the games last season. We played majority of the time on the left-hand side. Now I feel like it's being more spread out just because of the personnel we have in the team. Going forward, I really like Oriana, and I think he's going to improve, improve, improve. And as time goes on, you know, it could be the sign where we, we might not miss Barry out. But at the minute, you can only say we're missing him because of the assists and chances he creates. But Oriano is still doing a good job. Yep. Yeah, it's a both and. And, you know, uh, Todd, again, just get in touch and let us know if you think Luca is yeah, a step up into that, that gap. Yeah. Um Man, Justin, long episode today. We had a lot of talk to talk about, but a lot of positivity. Love sending love for Corey Baird scoring that goal. You know, sending love his way. Uh, Thanks for doing it, my friend. Anytime, coach. Coach, I feel like these episodes are getting longer. I don't know if it's me over talking, coach, or the questions are getting harder that we need to really think about it, coach. Coach, really? No, you're making it harder for me, and I feel like I have to watch the game. Really, I can't just enjoy the game. I have to watch the game more than once to think about the questions that I might be asked, what you're going to ask me, what the listener's going to ask me. I like the interaction I have with with you um, and the fans during and after games. It's great. Great questions by the listeners. Great that they're paying attention, listening to us. And it's great, Coach. I'm really enjoying it. And I'll, I'll be honest, Coach, I'm loving doing it. And thanks. Like I, I can't thank you enough for having me on here. So it's great. Don't forget to subscribe to us also on YouTube. <laughs> and that is it for this episode of talking tactics with coach Goff. if you want to do a huge favor make sure you're subscribed and head on over to cincinnati soccer talk coach apple podcast to rate and review, review the show other than that thanks for listening thanks to my co-host justin hoyt and thanks as always to producer charles for making this show audible i had fun today and i'm hoping you did too this is coach brad Goff reminding you that soccer is a privilege so whether watching coaching or playing Don't forget to smile.